Today on The Mass Golfer, we talk with some homegrown talent on the LPGA and PGA tours. We visit with a Massachusetts golf company celebrating its 100 years in business. There is big news for some major events coming to the Bay State. We'll learn how courses are rated, plus an update on golf in the Commonwealth, and some top shots. All straight ahead on The Mass Golfer. Hello and welcome to The Mass Golfer. I'm your host, Stephen Hanjack. For those familiar with golf in Massachusetts, the name Megan Kang has been a popular one ever since her teenage years as one of the best golfers in the state. But in 2023, she finally had her breakthrough moment with a win on the LPGA Tour. Success didn't come to Megan Kang overnight, but she did have a great deal of success along her journey. By the time she was 18, she had qualified for three U.S. Women's Opens and was the low amateur in 2015. So when she pulled into a Suncoast event as a teenager, her father, who was at the time Megan's teacher and then caddy, had a question. You want to turn pro? And I was, I was like, what? Because <laughs> we talked about it before, but I, I didn't really think about turning pro before Q school. So he asked me and we talked about it. And as we turned into the golf course, I, I look at him and I go, yeah. Yeah, I'm pro. Her career on the LPGA began upon getting through Q School with a tie for six. From her first year on, she has continually made a lot of cuts, as evidenced by being a member of three Solheim Cup teams. But a victory on the LPGA Tour had eluded her. That is, until the CPKC's Women's Open in Vancouver, Canada. Megan followed up her second round 66 with a 68 and a three shot lead heading into the final round. You look at the leaderboard and you know who's behind you and you know you try to ignore it as much as you can but it's it's kind of scary but you know I, I kind of told Jack today like hey you know let's do our best to try to stay in our own little world and you know take it one shot at a time and just you know kind of keep playing like we have been this week. On the final day Megan needed this four foot putt on 18 to force a playoff which she made. That's probably one of my best shots that I've hit under that kind of pressure knowing that you need a birdie to kind of force a playoff, and it, to make that birdie putt even the amount of stress. I know it wasn't super long, but I was very happy to put a good stroke on it because it's, these greens are tough and they're fast, and it all worked out. <laughs> In the playoff, Jin Young Ko hit into a hazard and took a double while Megan made par. That playoff, I just kind of, I tried to stay in my own little world. I, I didn't even know where Jin Young had hit her tee shot. I was just trying to, you know, keep my head down and, and try to stay in the moment and, you know, not, not get ahead of myself. Congratulations to Megan, an LPGA Tour winner and the national champion of Canada after her victory at the CPKC Women's Open. The number one shoe in golf, FootJoy, has called Massachusetts home for 100 years. Recently, we visited their Brockton offices to discuss not only the past, but also what the next 100 years will be like. I mean, it's a pretty incredible history. There's not many brands that have been around for 100 years. Uh, and not only have we been around, but we've been leading for every single one of those. In 1910, a guy named Pearlie Flint started working um, for the company. He was an avid golfer and he started to tinker um, with golf shoes, uh, performance-based golf shoes. So putting traction elements on the underside of, golf, uh, of footwear to optimize his performance on the course. So he started to play with that. And then in the 20s, that's when we started to commercialize golf shoes. Um, there was a competition to name this new line of shoes. It was a seamstress on the factory line that came up with the name uh, FootJoy with the tagline, the shoe that's different. Um, and that is the, uh, the formal founding of FootJoy back in 1923. One of the biggest responsibilities for us here in Brockton is to make sure that we're looking forward and not backward. We have 100 years of experience. Um, we've been tried and true. We're, we're number one on tour. But the challenge for us really is incorporating what's happening today and how do we rewrite that story for the next 100 years. So the team's looking at how the golf game has continued to evolve. We want to be inclusive of all of our core consumers, our new consumers, the new entrants of the game, the females, the kids, the people of color that are picking up a golf club for the first time. Um, and that's one of the most exciting things creatively because it allows us to use our expertise but to incorporate you know, new and, and, and progressive ways of styling. If you think of our, about our brand and what makes our brand unique and what makes our brand special, I think the first one is that singular focus on the game of golf. 
Golf is all we do. You know, we exist in a pretty competitive marketplace and we've got a lot of really big competitors who do some things really well. But one of the benefits that we have is intense focus on the game of golf, intense focus on doing everything that we can to apply performance, innovation, design leadership around the game of golf exclusively. Everything we do starts and ends with the golfer in mind. So I think today you're seeing the casualization of golf um, more and more, uh, more brands entering the space, which again is flattering. Um, but what we do is we focus on performance, right? And that's where we have an innovation lab here in Brockton. Uh, we utilize our, our resources uh, at Titleist at Manchester Lane to ensure that we're constantly testing. We're ensuring that everything that goes into our golf shoes is a performance aspect that's going to present a better opportunity for you to play with confidence um, versus what you're seeing from other brands at the moment. Our, our history is um, one of our greatest assets and you know we've got 10 decades of proving our products in the game of golf through performance and innovation. Uh, 1927, Walter Hagen selected FootJoy as the first footwear brand at the first Ryder Cup uh, in Worcester, Mass, up the street. In 1945, we became the number one shoe on the PGA Tour. Think about that. We've been number one every single year on the PGA Tour since 1945. I think that's 75 plus years uh, of uninterrupted leadership. But you know, we have that expertise that, that, uh, that just by proving it over 100 years that we can tap into um, with everything that we make. Up next, we talk to Keegan Bradley, and we see how courses are rated when the mass golfer returns. This segment of the mass golfer is brought to you by Youth On Course, getting kids on the golf course for just $5 per round. Welcome back to the mass golfer. I'm Stephen Hanjack. Keegan Bradley is another Bay State product that had a terrific year on the PGA Tour. We caught up with him to find out what it was like growing up as a golfer in New England and how it felt to win the Travelers Championship as the local favorite. This season's so short, I always had to try to maximize it. I, my, some of my favorite memories are playing in this fall weather. Coming up 18 when it's almost dark, it's freezing cold. Uh, you know, we the, the playing golf with the leaf roll where if you hit it in the leaf, you, you could drop it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud, probably the thing I'm most proud of is where I'm from. And this, this area means a lot to me and I think it's, it's in my sort of core of how I go about my job and how, how I play golf. It was time to go to the course and I'm, I'm driving in the gates at Harvard and the cops are that stop yard giving me high fives. And, you know, it's just, we're friendly people. It was heavy, man. It was, uh, it was heavy. And, um, you know, in those moments, especially in golf, I didn't know if I was going to be able to do this. As much as I wanted it, I just didn't. Some days, you know, you don't, you don't have it, and it was, it was terrifying. Drift of this moment forever. New England's very own takes the title at the Travelers. I got to share that with my family, my, you know, my 20 family members there and friends and everybody. And then I got to share it with the fans of New England. I felt it for, I still feel it. That's the stuff you dream about as a kid. I and mean, you don't really dream about, you know, winning money and doing all that. You dream about walking up 18 in Boston, in New England, at Travelers. And sometimes I have to pinch myself that that actually happened. It's really uh, surreal sometimes, you know, my life that I, you know, that I grew up, you know, watching every Red Sox game, all the Boston sports, and then being able to go in there and throw out the first pitch, it's, it's really, it's really wild. It's like, an, it's sort of like I'm watching myself do it, because it doesn't seem like it really, it really happens, and I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have been able to do stuff like that. I feel an obligation to represent New England in the golf world and to play my very best to, to show maybe some young kids that are trying to do get out on the tour. I want to show them that it's possible. Mass Golf offers many services to member clubs. One of them is having golf courses rated. We recently followed the course rating team as they rated a course in Bristol County. Well, the first thing we do is we actually kind of get scorecard data from the course. Uh, information as to how long the course is from different tee sets. 
Obviously you got the back tees, the middle tees, the forward tees. All that information gets inputted into our CRS, which is our course rating system. It's a platform that the USGA puts together. All the courses in the country are basically housed right there. All the information from those courses and the ratings, you know, come from that. The course rating is really how a scratch golfer would play the golf course. How difficult is that golf course for the scratch player? Obviously, the higher that number, the more difficult that course is going to be for all players. But really, that number is how difficult the course would play for the scratch golfer. The uh, slope is really the relative difficulty of the golf course for the bogey golfer versus the scratch. And it's just specific to that golf course. It's one of the most misunderstood points in, uh, in course rating. Everybody thinks it's just an absolute driving force on how hard a golf course is. But the decimal point number, the course rating, is really the one that is going to indicate how hard the golf course is. And the slope number is how hard that golf course is from a specific tee set for the bogey golfer versus the scratch golfer. So the number of tee sets that a course needs to be rated really kind of dictates how many raters we're going to bring to a course. There's a, a whole bunch of different data that we collect, but simple things uh, would be the width of a fairway. The scratch would fly at 230 yards in the air with 20 yards of roll, and the bogey male golfer would fly at 180 yards with 20 yards of roll for 200 yards. So one of the first things we would do is we would drive out to those landing zones for both the scratch and the bogey golfer and measure the fairway width. And from the middle of the fairway, we would measure the closest lateral obstacles. So is there a red stake penalty area, extreme rough, or anything that would qualify as a obstacle laterally? And then from those landing zones, how far is the shot to the green? Uh, the green target value is a big driver in course rating. And uh, a person's approach shot uh, will dictate how, whether the green target value is high or low. And so from that number, you also derive a bunker rating. And that bunker rating has a lot to do with the percentage of the green that's covered by bunkers. And is there any depth adjustment for those bunkers? Or is there some fescue that's just close to the green or some you know, variable uh, you know, inconsistent heights of cut? So that's a, those are the, the three big drivers there, the green target rating, uh, rough and recovery and bunkers and of course uh, the obstacles uh, from the center of the fairway lateral obstacles so uh, is it out of bounds is it a red stake penalty area those types of things it's uh, really that course rating if it's done accurately and the numbers are, are correct um, it'll it brings equity to the game Coming up, we take a look at how golf continues to grow in Massachusetts. And the USGA and LPGA make big announcements with major events headed to the Bay State when the Mass Golfer returns. This segment of the Mass Golfer is brought to you by MGM Music Hall at Fenway. Become a VIP member with benefits that include pre-sale concert notice, premium reserve seating, exclusive VIP lounges, and more. Visit CrossroadsPresents.com forward slash memberships to learn more. Welcome back to the Mass Golfer. I'm Stephen Hanjack. The golf community in Massachusetts continues to grow. Recently, we spoke with the executive director and CEO of Mass Golf, Jesse Menachem, for an update on golf in Massachusetts. Mass Golfers, here we are again. Another season has finished up. We are wrapping up the fall and uh, want to thank you for being a part of our family, our community, and for really helping us celebrate what was an incredible season and year in 2023. We have a lot to talk through and a lot to cover, but first and foremost, the momentum, the growth, and the trajectory that we continue to see is absolutely remarkable. Our membership has jumped over 30% since the pandemic. We continue to sustain those numbers and reach out to public golfers and to new golfers uh, in ways we have never seen before. Uh, 122,000 members and growing. Our member clubs continue to grow as well, uh, two-thirds of which are public access facilities. On top of that, we celebrated milestones for several anniversary years of centennials, 125th celebrations, course renovations, and all. So to kick off the year in the spring, we were able to unveil the 2022 Economic Impact Study, which was done in partnership with the Alliance of Massachusetts Golf Organizations. These numbers unveiled a $3.3 billion economic impact, which is tremendous growth from the 10 years prior when we did an economic impact study then. The impact study also unveiled the presence of our junior programs in the state, 
and their growth in the last year. From First Tee of Massachusetts, growing in program locations, but also in participants, to the Youth On Course program, where we're able to provide funding and support for kids to have access so they pay no more than $5 per round. And then to close out the season, we're able to sworn in and recognize our new slate of officers and directors for the organization with our new president, Megan Bierce of Thorny Lee Golf Club, now the first female president of our organization, someone we look forward to championing, supporting, and growing all that we're doing throughout Mass Golf. Fresh off the incredible success of the 2022 U.S. Open at the Country Club in Brookline, the USGA returned to announce upcoming national championships to be played at this historic venue. We are thrilled to be back. I can't believe it's been uh, almost a year and a half now, but we had an unbelievable open here last year and we couldn't wait to come back, obviously, and come back in, in full force. Yes. I can't really describe how I'm feeling in a minute. I'm five nine right now. I'd say that's pretty good. Whoa. It's where Francis Wimet grew up before becoming a part of what many believe is the most important moment this country has ever seen in this game of golf. Country Club has hosted the second most USJ championships of any club in America, 17. And we're excited to grow that number today by four. Pretty cool. Over the next 25 years and this long-term relationship, we'll be, we'll be bringing four USJ national championships back to the club, all of which fit into our intentional strategy about the player journey. For players, and we talk to the players, we ask the players, we created a capability that communicates with them more than we ever have. We ask them where they want to win. And they love this place. They want to come back. Not just open champions, but amateur champions. And I think winning where the great moments have occurred, it just makes it that much more meaningful. The return of the LPGA to Massachusetts is another reason to be excited for the 2024 golf season. to kind of have it in my home state and you know I can't wait for all my friends and all the other girls on tour to come see what Massachusetts has to offer. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome women's golf, the LPGA, the FM Global Championship to Massachusetts and to New England. We know this tournament is going to have an incredibly positive impact on the region. I mean, it, it means so much um, to be able to play in front of a home crowd, family, friends that I grew up playing with, um, people that have never seen me play live or in person too. I mean, it's just going to be incredible. This city, this state is so big in the sports. I mean, I grew up with a huge Red Sox, Patriots, hockey fan in my my husband still lives and dies by the Bruins, and there's just so much rich, rich history. I mean, even in Worcester, where I grew up, Worcester Country Club, I mean, it was the site of the first Ryder Cup. So there's so much rich, rich history with sports in this town and in New England. And to be able to bring women's golf here back again, it's just, I think it's just going to add and elevate sports in Massachusetts and in New England. Still ahead, we look at some of the top shots from the 2023 tournament season in Massachusetts. This segment of The Mass Golfer is brought to you by Titleist, the number one ball in golf and foot joy, the number one shoe in golf.
Welcome back to The Mass Golfer. I'm Steven Hanjack. It was a memorable year yet again for Mass Golf Championships. To showcase the best moments from 2023, we gathered the top shots from championship events held in Massachusetts. John Broderick made history at the Massachusetts Amateur, setting the course record at Essex County Club with an eight under par 62. He coolly curled in this 15-foot birdie putt on the 18th hole for his eighth birdie of the day to stamp his name in the record books. Next up is the winning putt from the Massachusetts Women's Amateur. That's Rebecca Scholar sealing the victory on the 17th hole at Dedham Country and Polo Club. Andrew DeRamio is known for his one-handed putting but that wasn't needed at the mass four ball as he holed this one to vault up the leaderboard. Needless to say, his partner, Ryan Whitney, was pleased with the result. And I had about 10 feet up the hill for birdie on 18. He said, don't even worry about this. I'm gonna hold this bunker shot from 33 yards down the hill, left to right, and he did. That's kind of what this guy does. He butts one-handed, he comes up in the clutch. It's a very, very amazing shot that I'm still laughing at. What appeared to be a rather normal tee shot had much deeper meaning as Molly Smith made some history of her own at Essex County Club, becoming the first woman to ever compete in the Massachusetts Amateur. At the Massachusetts Amateur Public Links, Ben Spitz had this putt for Eagle to win the championship in a playoff. I was due for a long one, so uh, I wasn't expecting to make it, just trying to two putt, get down, get down in two, and yeah, it was nice to, nice to make it. It was awesome. It's great. And back at the Women's Amateur at Dedham Country and Polo Club, Lillian Gulisarian hit the shot of the year when she aced the par three fifth on her way to a Final Four appearance. And those are the top shots from the 2023 Mass Golf season. We hope you enjoyed the Mass Golfer. It's an exciting time for the game of golf. And if you'd like to learn more, visit our website at massgolf.org. There you can follow events, learn how to get a handicap index or link to our social media. I'm Steven Hanjack and let's make today a golf day. Produced by Mass Golf in association with Sociable.